trouble, yeah. Yeah, so this whole nation's in trouble. Yeah. We have I trouble. Mean, but all the, tri the tribulation and all the different times and how they're breaking it all up. And yeah. Is any of that important? No. No, only what the Bible says. All of history has been tribulation. Sure. It, it's history. It's going to be trouble yeah. until the day we're gone. What, what Jesus says, that's what we're going to be talking about right now. That's what we believe, okay? Well, I know that, but I'm just, why do they spend so much time and everything they got, I, I, I should bring it to you. I started going to some of the Bible classes. Yeah. And I'm thinking, well, why is it that we don't study all of that stuff? It's, we've got to believe what he says. It doesn't matter. He's well, right? we'll be talking about that right now in a few minutes. Before we get started, let's, let's have a word of prayer. Most loving Father, once again, we come before thy mighty presence this morning, thanking you for another day that you have given us, thanking you for your grace, dear Heavenly Father, and we thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for giving us the wonderful opportunity once again of coming here this morning to have this wonderful fellowship with you, dear God, through your word, and to have this camaraderie with one another, and together we can study, study your word, and become stronger in your word and in faith also to God. We ask that you may bless us this morning as we continue to do those things that are right in your heart, dear God. And that is to teach the scriptures the way they should be taught. We ask that you will be with each and every one of us here this morning. May you forgive us for our weaknesses when we do fall short to your glory, dear God. But we pray that we may continue to walk by faith and not by sight. For these things we ask in Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. Now verse 18 and 19 of the book of Romans. And let's not forget that when Romans, in the book of Romans, uh, first chapter, first verse, it says there is no condemnation for those who, are, who don't walk according to the flesh, but walk according to the spirit. There's no condemnation for those members of Lord's body that walk according to the spirit. So if we walk according to the spirit, as Paul says in the first verse of chapters 8 of the book of Romans, we have nothing to fear, okay? We walk with Christ until we die. We keep on the faith, regardless of the circumstances, and never leave him. Because the hour is coming. If you turn over the book of John, 5th chapter, 28th verse, 29th, 28th to the 29th, and I'll read this. Now we're talking about what 18 and 19 says in the book of Romans, which says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. So members of the Lord's body are waiting for that glorious day. Okay? Now in the book of John, of the fifth chapter, beginning with the 28th verse, Jesus is talking to his disciples. Now, in the meantime, the Jews were contemplating to kill Jesus because Jesus was saying that he was the Son of God. And they didn't like that. So, they were already contemplating to kill Jesus. So as you move on down here to John, to John 5, 26, listen to what Jesus says. Everybody have that? John 5, verse 25. It says, Truly, truly, I say to you, the hour is coming. Okay? We don't know when that hour is going to be. Okay? It could be tomorrow. It could be next year. It could be the next hundred years. We don't know. That's why one has to be prepared, okay? Now it says, Surely, truly, I say, the Lord is coming and is now here, okay? When the dead will hear this voice of God 
and those of you will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he, so he has granted the Son able to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. We're talking about Jesus. Now this is what he says in 28. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in their tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Okay? So, what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory that is waiting for us. Okay? All mankind is waiting patiently and hopefully for that future day when God resurrects his children. Now in the resurrection, all voice. I don't know how that's going to be, but God is God and he is capable of doing anything that he wants. Those people on the far side of the other earth, on this side, western, eastern, whatever it is, they're all going to hear his voice at the same time. So, they're going to hear his voice and both good and bad will be raised from the dead at the same time when Christ comes. Do you remember the story that was mentioned in the Vacation Bible School on Monday? Robert didn't get to it. He read it, but he kind of bypassed it, which is very important. He talked about a person, a master, was leaving the country and he entrusted money to three individuals. One, he gave so much money, the other, so much more, and the other individual, just one talent. Now, the man that was going to fall off was Jesus. And when he was going to return, he says, until I return, that's the resurrection to you, the coming day of Jesus. So he entrusted the God of the apostles to spread the word, the gospel. He entrusted that to him. After they had passed on, they were entrusted to the other believers that were still alive. And so on and so on. Until today. Okay? We are entrusted with the gospel. Okay? We have this talent. God has given us this talent. Now if the if this man was given one talent, he was given maybe ten talents, and he was still doing the same thing, buried it. So what did he do? Buried the gospel. He was unfaithful. Okay? He was useless. He didn't work to bring people to Christ. But the others, they doubled in their gold and their money, or all you should say, as the scriptures go, but they doubled in people bringing them to the worship service, to the church. They baptized people, they saved people, and they kept doubling and doubling and doubling. And this is what's going to happen today. This is, we're entrusted with that gospel today. We can't bury the gospel, because if we bury the gospel, we're going to find out at the end. Those who are alive in Christ Jesus will rise, and those who are been bad to the resurrection will arise, and they'll be going to a special place, eternal condemnation, because they buried that beautiful treasure. And we can't do that. How many times have people preach the gospel and nobody hears? They, they think that they hear, but they're not. They're blind and their ears are dull. And they just don't want to listen to the gospel. And at the same time here, we suffer. We suffer because that has nothing to do, it's actually compared to, it, it's not compared to the glory that we're going to have. And so in the resurrection of eternal life, those who are in Christ asleep, they'll rise up, and also those outside of Christ, who rejected the gospel, will also rise 
to condemnation. Now, as I read here about in John, just before that, the Jews wanted to kill Jesus because he said that he was a son of God. And they wanted to kill him. That's why Paul says, pray for Israel that they may change their mind. And so, the hour is coming, as Paul says, as John said also. In 1 Corinthians 15, 50 to 54, open that book, I'm going to read that also. 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians 50 through 54. First Corinthians 15 to 54. 15 verses 50 and 54. Paul was talking to the Corinthians, okay? They had a troubled church. All kinds of things were happening in the church. Paul was constantly reminding them of certain things. And Paul tells them here a little mystery. He says, I tell you, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You know what that means? That we as sinners, the way we are in our state, we will never inherit the kingdom of God. That's what we have to change in the twinkle of an eye when Jesus comes. That is, if we are Christians and members of the Lord's body, are waiting for his glory. The others will also be changed, but they'll be changed for condemnation. So, Paul says, I tell you, I tell you, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does, the, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you in this dream, we shall not all sleep, but we will all be in the moment of a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For the perishable body must put on an imperishable, and this mortal body must be, immort must be on immortality. So when the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on the immortality, then shall we come to pass saying, it is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? So, man's present date, as we talked about this particular verse, man's present date is impossible to be um, enjoy eternal life in our present state. That's what Paul is saying. And so, the entire heaven, to enter heaven, I should say, we have to receive new bodies in order for us to enter heaven because this body can't go. So he says, I tell you a mystery. Of course, in scripture, that which has not been revealed yet, it's been a mystery for them. We shall not all sleep, Paul says. Some members of the body of Christ would still be alive in judgment day. Might be you, might be me, you never know when the judgment day is gonna come. But somebody, one of the members of the Lord's body, is going to be alive on that day. It could be 100 years from now, it could be next year, 10 years from now. Some will be alive when the, when, the, when the Lord comes. And so, they will go to an instantaneous change, the moment of a twinkling of eye. You know, if you blink your eye, the change is taking place according to God, the way he's going to do it. I don't know 
man's going to do it. But with him, all things are possible. But this is what is going to happen. This is what we're waiting for. All the scriptures, all the study, all the sermons, and everything, this is what it's for. We can't close the doors. We can't take a vacation and say, we're going to take a vacation in the church and, 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 and in a few months come back. Jesus died for the church. We are the church. So when the sound trumpet comes, it sounded, all will be called to judgment. That's going to be a fearful day for some and a glorious day for others. That's what Paul is talking about in verse 18 through 19 of the book of Romans of the 8th chapter. It's going to be a glorious day for those who await the judgment. And it's a day for those who are waiting for the creation. Immortality means that, that one who is incapable of dying immortal death. This is the experience of those who are in Christ Jesus. So these things are going to happen. And when the disciples, when the Jews heard that Jesus was the Son of God, and he gives them all these things in the book of John, the fifth chapter, they want to kill him for saying those things. But it's true. Paul says, pray for Israel in the next few chapters. Pray for Israel that they may repent. There was a few remnant that repented. Just like there was a few remnant Gentiles that repented as well. But there's going to be a glad day and a sad day. I wish we knew that song. There's a glad, there's a glad, glad day coming, a glad day coming. There's a glad day coming by and by when the saints will. Uh, da 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 da. <laughs> you know, and that's that's in the book. You know, we should read. I think it's in a book of song. Uh, is it? Do it. There's a there's a great day coming. there's a great day coming. Yeah. I don't know if it's on there or not. We used, to, we used to sing it quite a bit. I don't, I don't see it. No, it must be in the old book then. Yeah. I can get it. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta read that song. You know that song, right? Yeah. Okay. Now that song would have to go with a nice lesson. So people can understand what's taking place. You got my ears? Okay, listen to verse 20, 24, and 25. Verse 20. For the creation was subject to futility, not willing, but because of him who was subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from the bondage and corruption and, the, and obtained the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For I know now that the whole creation has been growing together in pain like of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of his sons and the redemption of our bodies. For the creation, mankind was made subject to fertility Vanity, uselessness. All became conditions with sorrow and frustrations which come upon man as a result of the fall of Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. This is not willingly, not of its own. but by the sentence of God. Introducing sin. The same introduced sin 
He committed it, introducing sin to Adam, who committed it. So, but we are still subject to hope. Even as God pronounced the curse upon Satan and the woman and the man for their role in the fall, and thus brought them under the rule of futility, uselessness, vanity. So he gave man hope by promising a redeemer, Jesus. Genesis 3 and 15. Man was subject and man was subjected to hope. Before that, there was no hope for man. What the devil did to Adam and Eve, there was just no hope. No hope whatsoever. No hope. So it took Jesus to die on the cross so the blood would go all the way back. These people suffered terribly because of what Adam and Eve did. They fell to the devil. And that's what happens today, huh? People fall to the devil and they leave the church. Jesus says, the word of God says, don't do this, and they do it. Don't do that, and they still do it. Sometimes we're foolish people. Foolish means without understanding. Sometimes we become foolish. Just like Paul told the Galatians, you foolish people, what caused you to go to another gospel. <laughs> so what the devil created through Adam and Eve, Jesus had to die on the cross. He didn't, he didn't want to, but that was the only way to cleanse the sin from the earth through his blood. And when around this verse, actually is part of verse 20, bondage and corruption could apply to the seed of Adam, and God has kept him, God has kept him, God has kept his promise by the means of deliverance, which was now valuable in Christ Jesus. But look how long it took. Genesis all the way to the book of Matthew when Jesus died on the cross. Thousands of years. And so, then, uh, the grace is now available through Christ Jesus, his gospel. Someone read 2 Timothy 1 and 10. which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. All right. Abolished death, sin and death, and brought life to all who choose to accept it. And 22, all men had been kind of groaning, had been groaning, as a woman giving birth to a child. The whole human family has suffered together as a result of sickness and pain and sorrow. All because of the fall up at that very moment. Groaning means an expression of pain that goes beyond mere physical pain. Paul associates groaning with a childbirth. He's telling this to the Romans. Things that happened and things that are going to happen. And the Romans understood. And some of the Jews did not understand. That's why they wanted to kill Paul also. So in 
verse 23 that I just read also, we as Christians, even though we have the Holy Spirit in us, the knowledge of the future glory, we groan inwardly. Members of the Lord's body will suffer along with others as they write, or as they wait for deliverance of, from this corruption in verse 21 that we talked about. The mortal and the immortal, as we read in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 54, the redemption of our body to be released from pain and suffering forever. And this is going to happen. The hour is coming. We don't know when that day is going to be. But many false religions already know when the day is going to be. By writing books and, and all this kind of stuff. They're talking about the climate change is going to change everything and we're going to be pulverized. Human will no, humans will not longer be in the earth and on and on and on. People believe it. And so, the resurrection of the body brought back forth the grave, as we read Genesis 5, 28 through 29. Send me up in the book to 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. All right. How many believe this is going to happen? We all believe that, right? Yes, Lori? Was that a question or do you believe? <laughs> okay. That's going to happen. But the skeptics say it's not going to happen. Those that don't believe in Jesus, it's not going to happen. Once you die, you just get to die. That's it. We're, the earth will keep on going. The mind will keep on going. Like it has been going. It goes, ah, you're right, you know. You're right. They do all these things without even having the knowledge of God in their hearts. But there's going to be a day. And we will meet Jesus in the air. People say that Jesus is going to be stepping on the earth, speaking of Jehovah's Witnesses, right? He's going to come to the earth. He's going to actually uh, rule the earth here. And he's going to, those people that are in the earth that didn't make it to heaven, they're going to teach those people all over again. Jehovah's Witness is a large organization. Why do you think that? I told you that letter that I received from the Jehovah's Witnesses. Hello, neighbor. Gives me all kinds of scripture that doesn't even match what they're saying. But that's what they believe. So the sufferings of this present time are not worth to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed to us. Romans 8 and 18. Someone read Romans 8 and 18. We just read it, right? What does it say? I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So I have an appointment I don't know when that's going to be. But that appointment has our names. We have to meet that appointment. Whether you want to cancel it or not, you're going to meet it. Because we're all going to die. And some will be alive on the day of judgment. I don't know if it's going to be us. I don't think so. 
but you never know. Verse 24. For this hope, we were saved. The hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes of what he sees? But if we hope, verse 25, but if we hope what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. With patience. We have the perfect parallel here in this passage of Hebrews 11 and 1. Someone read Hebrews 11 and 1. Now hope is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Is that what it says? Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Right. So, we do not need conviction or evidence for things that we are able to see and look. Look for ourselves. But we do not hope for that which we already have. We hope for those things that we don't have, that we can't see. What do you think they call Donald Thomas Thomas? What do you do to make that name that we have it today? Everybody says Doubting Thomas. What did he do? He had to see it to believe it. He had to see Jesus to believe it. And he had to see what? The wounds, right? In order to believe it. And that day, I mean, Thomas was with the rest of the disciples for over three years. He didn't learn anything of what Christ was telling him. And Christ was very patient with him, didn't he? Very patient. He didn't get mad. He didn't get mad. But then after he felt his body, after he looked, what did he say? My Lord, my God. But he had to see. And Philip, Lord, show us the Father. Sure, it's the Father. Jesus says, Philip, you've been with me for about three, three and a half years. You see me, you see the Father. What's wrong with you guys? But he was very patient. Well, we should have patience also, as verse 25 tells us. This is a, this is a key word here is what allows a Christian to continue to live his life without danger of running away from Christ. Patience. Oh, Jesus is not going to come. I'm tired of that. People say he's going to be crazy. Lack of patience, lack of hope, lack of love. We may not catch ourselves saying that. But people say that. Look at all the demonstrations that are going out throughout the world. They don't care if the world ends. They don't think that there's going to be a condemnation time for them. They don't want to hear that. They just want to hear themselves demonstrating, trying to push an issue that could be harmful to mankind. The devil is working on them. Because this is what the devil does. You see it all around. Any comments? Now, we shouldn't be afraid of this. It should actually plant us in a more solid structure. Wait for that glory. Wait for that glory. And in the meantime, we do say we fall short of the glory of God. Things happen to us. And that's where repentance comes in. Because we can't. Sometimes we just lose our patience, not at Christ, but lose our patience to one another. We have to be loving and patient with one another. We have to do all things in order. 
Someone turn to 1 Corinthians 14 and 40. 1 Corinthians 14 and 40. things have to be done decently and in order without arguing with no lack of patience but be patient we're all loving Christians we all have different ideas we all think different okay and just because we're members of the Lord's body don't think that we're not going to argue we're going to argue I argue in my life all the time so I am. So I don't think that the church won't argue. Okay? There's got to be an argument, but we have to have it decently and in order. You know, when they had that Declaration of Independence, there was all kinds of arguing going on. A lot of the people were going to write, put their names in the Declaration of Independence. There was arguing. I'm leaving. I'm tired of this. You know, you guys aren't doing nothing. They're closing some of these people, closing the doors on them. And it was a tough time for these leaders to write the Declaration of Independence. All kinds of arguing going on. But they wrote it. They wrote it. And we abide by them. Five minutes. Five minutes. And so, verse 27, or did I read this? I saw 26 already. I read 26 already. And so, verse 27 here, and he says, and he who searches the hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes with the saints according to the will of God. He knows our hearts. So you can't hide from that. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what, are you going to, what you're going to do. You know, we're raising our children. I know what you're going to do. You better stop thinking about it. Right? He knows what we're going to do. He knows our hearts. He knows what the Spirit is saying. Because He is the Spirit. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is the mind and the will of God. So He knows everything. God also knows the mind of the inner man, the spirit of the inner man. He knows deep into your heart what you're thinking. Whether the Lord thing or done through the spirit and are capable of according to the will of God. We've got a man, the Holy Spirit, the person that's within us along with God and Christ. He knows exactly what we're thinking. You know, sometimes we think wrong things. You know, sometimes we can do something and think the wrong thing. And uh, you say, I, sh I shouldn't have thought about that. But it came out anyway in my mind. But God knows that's when you should repent. I hope nobody heard me. They can't hear your mind but God can read your heart. So we can't hide things from him. We can't hide things from our spouses. We can't hide things from the loved ones. We've got to be the real McCoy. And so, verse 28, last verse. And we know that those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. All things means the happenings of our life. All things. When we're on this earth, we are in a mortal state. And this
This includes a form of suffering and misfortune. But all these things happen. Some say, well, it happens maybe for the good, yes. It happens for the bad, yes. Maybe if this wouldn't happen, you know, we wouldn't have learned this or whatever. But we know that all things, those that love God, all things work together for the good. And I have experience with that in our own lives. You can see how things kind of suffered in that time, and, but everything was for the glory of God, and He knew those things. And it was for the glory of God, and the things that happened are good. And you can say, oh, Lord, you know, I thought this was going to be a bad, but this is a great thing that happened. I'm glad God's on our side. And so, when we're talking about for God, this means that the God of our soul of man, the good soul of the man, I should say, God made man for a particular purpose. According to Solomon, this purpose can be summed up in these very few words, Ecclesiastes 12 and 13. For fear, fear, uh, fear of God, keep the commandments, for this is a whole duty of man. Fear him, for this is a whole duty of man. I hope this is a wake-up call for everyone, because it is. It's for me. So, let's try to be more patient, more loving. Because there's a time coming. There's a great day coming. There's a great coming by and by. Oh, I love that song. I think uh, Dad will lead it when, when, when you need that song. Next week? Maybe the week after. All right. Exams doing next week. All right. <laughs> okay. Any final comments? Next week we'll go on to 20, from verse 29. Okay? And we're almost done with this particular chapter.